My pleasure today to introduce Lucan Wei. Uh, he's professor of political science uh, here at the U of T and the co-director of the Petro Yatsik program for the study of Ukraine. His research focuses on global patterns of democracy and dictatorship. His first book, Competitive Authoritarianism, Hybrid Regimes After the Cold War, was uh, co-written with uh, Stephen Levitsky uh, and published in 2010 by Cambridge University Press. His solo authored book, Pluralism by Default, The Weak Autocrats and the Rise of Competitive Politics, Johns Hopkins 2015, examines the sources of political competition in the former Soviet Union. He argues that pluralism in the developing world often emerges out of authoritarian weakness. Governments are too fra fragmented and states too weak to, mon to monopolize political control. His most recent book, again, is Stephen Levitsky, Revolution and Dictatorship, the Violent Origins of Durable Authoritarianism, will be published in the US on September 13th and in the UK on November 8th of this year. Uh, this book provides a comparative historical explanation for the extraordinary durability of autocracies, autocracies, uh, chi China, Cuba, USSR, you may want to add uh, one or two other candidates, I'm not sure, which are products of violent social revolution. Uh, uh, Lucan's work on competitive authoritarianism has been cited thousands of times and helped stimulate new and wide ranging research into the dynamics of hybrid democratic authoritarian rule. Uh, it is the first time I'm meeting Lucan, Lucan in person, but uh, I have uh, watched some of his presentations and panel discussions, and I'm always very impressed with the depth of his knowledge and the way he handled uh, uh, both uh, talks, panels, and questions. And of course, we are looking for, forward to questions uh, here after, after our break. So in this lecture, Lucan will address a most timely topic, uh, the reason, reasons for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Western reaction to it, and what is at stake for everyone. Lucan, over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, this is a topic um, that is uh, very close to my heart. I, uh, I lived in Ukraine um, when I did graduate work in the 1990s um, and actually spent much time in, and lived in, in Eastern Ukraine in Donetsk, which is currently occupied by pro-Russian forces. Um, and when uh, Russia kind of reinvaded Ukraine, um, in February 22nd, sorry, 24th um, of this year, it um, basically upended many lives. It was, um, sorry. oh, we just can't get all of you on. Sorry. Okay. Good. Um, and I, um, so it's basically, you know, it's, you know, one of the most momentous events in European history. Uh, and I'm going to talk today basically kind of focus the talk on two topics. First, the, you know, the central question of why Putin invaded. Um, and then sort of talk a little bit at the, about, you know, how the conflict is going um, and, you know, where it stands. So to begin with, um, um, why did Putin invade? Um, that is an, an incredibly important question, but I think it's worth emphasizing that it's ultimately an impossible question to answer because Putin, in, in a, a government like Russia, Putin has enormous personal power and is relatively unconstrained 
by, um, by forces outside of him. So ultimately, to understand why Putin invaded, you have to understand what is going on in one person's head. Right? <laughs> and, that, and that is not, you know, we're, political scientists are just, we just don't have the capacity to peer into um, his head. I am not, I um, am not his psychologist. Um, and so it's worth just sort of, you know, I think it, it, you know, it's worth emphasizing that. Nonetheless, I think we can sort of look at the evidence and make some kind of assessment. Um, so one common theory, which was um, popular, and one this is that, that, um, that Putin himself tried to propose was that, that uh, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine in February to prevent, as in a response to NATO um, expansion. And it's true that NATO in the last uh, 20 or so years, 15 years, has expanded dramatically. Uh, you know, NATO, the, since 1999, NATO has expanded, uh, the North American Treaty Organization has expanded and added 14 new members almost entirely all in, in, in Eastern Europe. So the question is, was this in some ways a response to uh, NATO invasion? And we see this theory kind of proposed by a number, by certainly by Putin himself, but by some on the left, including um, Noam Chomsky and others. Um, I do not think there is really any evidence that um, the invasion of Ukraine was a response to NATO expansion for a number of reasons. Um, first, uh, the uh, mem you know, NATO membership, it's not, when, when you talk about NATO expansion, it makes it sound like NATO is trying to reach into other countries and expand sort of like an empire expands. But in fact, in all cases, it's been those countries that have desperately pushed NATO like a blanket that wants to cover them. And it's been driven by domestic politics in the, in the new member countries. In other words, it hasn't been NATO that's been forcing the expansion, but the countries in Eastern Europe that really want to be under NATO's umbrella almost entirely to defend against the exact kind of invasion that Russia engaged in in February, 2022. The second piece of evidence, and I think this is the most convincing, you know, is that you know some say well that um, the invasion was to prevent uh, Ukraine from joining NATO. Um, the problem with this argument is that Russian NATO membership had already been precluded by Russia's earlier invasion of Ukraine in 2014. There was there is no way that um, NATO would have expanded even before the February invasion to a country in which there are contested international borders, which there have been in Ukraine since 2014, right? So, um, because if the, uh, you know, NATO were to expand to Ukraine, it would, would effectively mean a declaration of war against Russia, which NATO desperately does not want to, to engage in, right? Um, and so, NATO expansion had already been prevented by Russia's earlier invasion. So there's no rationale in regards to NATO um, for Russia uh, to invade, I mean, to prevent um, NATO expansion. Secondly, and thirdly, um, you know, I think you don't have to have a PhD in psychology to understand that an invasion of a country is only, you know, Russia would only strengthen NATO, not weaken it. Um, and this is quite predictable. And indeed, the, inv the invasion confirms the very raison d'etre of NATO, which was to prevent invasion. So by engaging this that behavior, um, and, um, you know, it, and, and this only strengthens NATO. And in fact, what we found is that in response to the invasion, uh, NATO expanded to Finland and Sweden. Um, and finally, when NATO expanded to Finland and Sweden, you know, Finland, which has, shares a large border with Russia, you know, there was basically no Russian response. 
So I think in balance, I think there's really basically no evidence, convincing evidence whatsoever that um, you know, the invasion was somehow a response to NATO. And I'm happy to talk more about that. Instead, I think the excellent, there's much more evidence for the role of great Russian nationalism, right? I think if this was a purely sort of an old fashioned, you know, imperialist war, right? Um, and indeed, the reason why um, Russia responded so differently to, to Ukraine as to Sweden and Finland is that Ukraine is uniquely um, considered by many Russians to be kind of part of Russia and not an independent country. So as many of you know, probably um, both Russia and Ukraine claim a common heritage in Kiev and Rus, which was a kingdom um, in the uh, 1800s to 1240. Um, and Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire, USSR, until 1991. And if you talk to many Russians, my Russian friends, I have many of them, um, many just simply do not see Ukraine as being independent. And the most direct evidence of the role of great Russia, of this kind of nationalism in motivating the invasion comes from the, from the mouth of this guy. You know, shortly before the invasion, he, had, he gave two speeches on television, February 21st, I think the other was February 23rd, in which he called the independent Ukraine bizarrely an invention of Vladimir Lenin. And Ukraine, he said, was an inalienable part of our own history, cultural, and spiritual space since time immemorial. So clearly, he has a vision that um, of Ukraine as, as as not being an independent state, as being part of Russia. And I will tell you that this view of Ukraine is not unique to to, to Putin, and is shared by many. Russians. Um, and in fact, I remember when I first came to Russia in the Soviet Union then in 1988, I think one of the first phrases that someone told me was Krim Nash, the Crimea is ours. Um, and that was, you know, when Crimea was part of Ukraine um, and still is, but um, they claim, you know, so that is, this is, you know, not invented by Putin, um, but part of sort of shared by many, many Russians. I don't think that most Russians would have, you know, necessarily on their own supported an invasion of Ukraine, but nonetheless, to me, it's clear that um, nationalism is what motivated um, Putin and the, the broadest level to invade. Now, um, Ukraine, uh, modern Ukrainian nationalism, I mean, no nation is, is ever from time memoriam. Uh, nations are created by human beings. Um, and the, the uh, formation of Ukraine as an independent nation can really be traced to uh, the 19th century when parts of what it, of today, Western Ukraine, were controlled by the Austro Hungarian Empire. Now, Western Ukraine, uh, at that point, uh, you know, that was called Mussini, um, the, the, the peasants in this area. And the Hungarian Empire was concerned that these peasants would either ally with the Poles to the north or with Russians to the east. So they consciously created, um, you know, helped foster an independent Ukrainian uh, language. And importantly, they also um, uh, you know, created an education system, you know, mass education, um, over 50% literacy in what is today Western Ukraine and Galicia, um, and basically created uh, a Ukrainian nation in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, I want to, to, to stress that Ukrainian nationhood was invented but so is every other nation in the world. That is not unique. Doesn't mean that sort of Ukraine is somehow less real 
I mean, every nation, you know, nations do not emerge out of the primordial ooze. You know, they are not, you know, part of the sky. They are created by human beings and in history, right? Um, anyway, so the, uh, Ukraine became independent in 1991. And for the first 25 years of Ukrainian existence as an independent state, it was starkly divided between Western Ukraine, which was quite um, pro-Ukrainian, um, and Eastern Ukraine, which um, was also supported uh, closer to Russia and historically, um, you know, was outside the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and this division between East and West, well, kind of more Ukrainophile, pro-Ukrainian West and a Russophile pro uh, Russian East, you know, defined Ukrainian politics for a very long time. And that's actually my book, Pluralism by Default, is very much about this dynamic. Um, and what was interesting about this period, the first 25 years of Ukrainian independence, is that Russia had enormous influence over Ukrainian politics. They controlled the, you know, they had uh, strong ties to uh, pro-Russian parties who came to power regularly in, in Ukraine. And so before the invade, the first invasion of 2014, when, when Russia invaded Crimea, Russia actually, you know, had enormous influence over Ukrainian politics that is now, by the way, completely gone, that has been wiped out by the invasion. Um, so this division between East and West was destroyed um, by the Russia's, when Russia following um, uh, overthrow of the dictator Yanukovych, uh, Ukrainian dictator Yanukovych, Russia, um, Euromaidan protests, Russia invaded Crimea um, in 2014 and, and aided uh, pro-Russian rebels in Donetsk and Donbass, which is where I used to live in the 1990s. Um, and so what's interesting also is that before 2014, support for NATO in Ukraine was quite low. But, you know, not surprisingly, when Russia invaded, support for NATO increased, and it's even increased much more now. It's close to 65 or so percent, 70 percent. And now to sort of finally understand, you know, I think of what um, sort of motivated the invasion, we have to talk about this guy. Um, Vladimir Zelensky, who I think, by the way, you know, is, um, he, was, he was elected president of Ukraine in 2019. And for those of you who don't know, um, he was a total outsider in the Ukrainian political system. Um, for most of Ukrainian history until 2019, Power was held by a relatively small group of Ukrainian elites, many of whom had ties to the old communist nomenklatura. Um, now, Zelensky was famous, as many of you probably know, because he was a comedian who um, starred in a television show about a school teacher who becomes president of Ukraine. And I highly encourage you to watch it. It's very funny. He's a very funny man. He's a great comedian. And there's something very weird about watching this television show. It's on Netflix. And, you know, there's sort of reality and, and art and reality. It's this kind of mind-blowing um, thing. Um, so I can tell you, during the, the election campaign in 2019, I was in Russia at the time. And um, the Russian media covered this, this uh, contest to a great deal it was between the President uh, Poroshenko and Zelensky. Um, and Russian media was very positive on Zelensky because he was culturally very Russian. He was born in central Ukraine, you know, kind of was culturally Russian, identified himself with Russian culture. And so when he was elected um, in 2019 with overwhelming support, um, from the Russophile, Russophone population parts of Ukraine, Putin was hopeful. He thought, okay, here's someone who I can work with, right? Um, however, um, Zelensky maintained 
you know, distance from Russia. Um, it refused to implement a peace uh, agreement on Russian's terms. If you're interested in this, I can talk about this later. Um, he, he, despite the fact that he was Russian speaking, he openly called for um, you know, membership in both the European Union and NATO. So, you know, this I think was you know part of this sort of in Putin. I'm sort of imagining again. I don't know what going, what's going on inside Putin's head. I'm sort of imagining it. You can imagine it with me. You tell me if you think differently. Um, that you know, this was sort of kind of he had these hopes that were dashed. Um, that sort of you know, even a sort of a Russophile, Russophone, what poli Ukrainian politician like Zelensky um, couldn't be directly controlled by Russia. And so that kind of created frustration. Um, and finally, um, I think, uh, you know, we have to sort of, what's interesting about the Russian view of Ukraine is that, you know, Russia has obviously deep ties to Ukraine. You know, there's, um, there is, a, you know, people, they have relatives in Ukraine. Most, many Russians have been to Ukraine. So you, you would think that, you know, that so these sort of ties would lead Russian elites to really understand Ukrainian politics. But in fact, this is not the case. I can tell you from talking to my Russian friends that they truly believe that a neo-Nazi uh, Ukraine, you know, that, that Zelensky is a neo-Nazi despite the fact that he's a Jew, and also his relative, his parent, his relatives died in, in the Holocaust. Um, and you know, it, this is so weird that they actually believe this. And I can tell you, I, I, you know, after the invasion, I had long, very unpleasant discussions on Facebook uh, message with a friend, a good friend of mine in Moscow, who is a very strong supporter of the invasion. It's been uh, I can tell you it's very difficult. Um, but the, you know, this reflects the kind of Russian view that there is no Ukraine. Furthermore, there was a perception of that Zelensky was weak. What's interesting, the Russian Secret Service in the run-up to the invasion sponsored uh, an opinion poll in Ukraine in which they looked at Russian Ukrainian attitudes towards Zelensky. He was actually quite unpopular. He was elected by 70%. But you know he's a TV star, and he didn't really know how to manage the economy. The economy went into the crapper, um, and so he was unpopular. Furthermore, uh, Putin saw in Europe many divisions, uh, and this is something that Russia, uh, over decades, was very um, good at developing. They basically tried to establish energy ties with Germany and other European countries. Um, the, the former um, chancellor of Germany, Gerhard Schroeder, was directly bought off and bribed by Putin um, uh, through um, membership in uh, Russian oil companies. And so Putin expected um, there to be a divided response uh, by Europe to the invasion. And finally, I mean, I should have had a map here, but I think you can remember, uh, you know, Russia is substantially larger than Ukraine. <laughs> I don't think you have to be, have a PhD to appreciate that. So there was expectation, not just by Putin, but by literally everyone else that, that Russia could easily defeat the Ukrainian military. Now, the invasion, uh, uh, contradicted many uh, people's expectations. Um, first of all, uh, in response to the invasion, um, in fact, the, the, the European response has been remarkably unified. Um, you know, basically all European countries, with the notable exceptions of Serbia and Hungary, um, who have very strong pro-Russian governments. So they, the, the, uh, the European countries have been 
unified in their support of Ukraine, which is not what people expected. Um, they instituted unprecedented sanctions, swift, you know, they cut off contacts uh, between Russian banks and Western banks. Uh, they, they cut off exports and imports. Um, you know, these were really unprecedented sanctions against Russia um, that we've really never seen anywhere so quickly. I think the, the closest equivalent probably is, you know, sanctions against Iran or North Korea. Um, and this, in a sense, um, presented a real, you know, in the initial weeks, a real threat, I think, to Putin, because for the first time, Russians, you know, uh, oligarchic elite interests were undermined by uh, Russian foreign policy. They had a heart that they could no longer own their yachts and go to, you know, shopping trips in Paris and, and the like, um, and sort of have their kind of international rich lifestyle. Um, so there was a moment when some of us hoped that there might be a kind of coup against Putin. This never happened, sadly. Um, but, you know, for a moment, it thought, we thought it might. Um, now we can, I can, you know, talk a little bit about sanctions later, but um, the sanctions overall have not had as much of an impact on uh, the Russian economy, largely because of the world's dependence on um, Russian energy. So while uh, the Europe has been giving a few billion dollars to, to Ukraine, it's also been giving literally billions of dollars to, to, to Russia in, um, in, you know, in exchange for gas and oil. Um, so that has really, you know, oil revenues and gas revenues, which are sort of core to the operation of the world economy, have um, really prevented, you know, the Russian economy from going in total free fall. At the same time, I would note that the Russian economy has still slowed, you know, all Western companies have, you know, almost all Western companies have left Russia. Uh, the Russian economy is set, it's expected to contract, um, according to the latest estimates, by between 10 and 13 percent. Um, by contrast, the global economy is supposed to increase by 3 percent. So clearly the sanctions have had, said, had some impact. Um, at the same time, you know, they're not severe enough to really kind of affect um, uh, Putin's power. Next, um, the Europeans um, have, almost all European countries have provided some form of lethal military assistance. Uh, the most important though, source of uh, assistance, to, military assistance to Ukraine by far is, um, is the United States. Um, I mean, without Biden, if Biden weren't there to give support to Ukraine, I think it's very likely that Putin would have succeeded in overthrowing uh, the Zelensky government. Okay, I'm just gonna end with just a brief overview of the conflict. Um, so, so when Russia initially invaded in the first three days, <coughs> it was expected that, that Russia would, you know, first of all, um, you know, Putin kept everyone guessing, uh, February 21st, 22nd, 23rd, as to what would happen, he, he gathered enormous numbers of troops. Um, but to me at the time, it didn't make sense that Russia would engage in an all out invasion of Ukraine, simply because um, it felt to me that ultimately, even if Russia could achieve a short term military victory, ultimately, you know, you know as in Afghanistan or Vietnam, so it's, it's, you know, historically it's been relatively easy or Iraq. Um, it's, you know, not so hard necessarily to overthrow the military of a country, but to maintain power and control over the country for a long time is highly costly. And indeed, uh, Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, you know, that was one of the factors that contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1980s. Um, nonetheless, Putin, literally surprised everyone, including his own government, by invading and carrying out a, a, a full-scale invasion of you, all of Ukraine uh, in an effort to set up a puppet government um, 
in Kiev. Um, and, I, and his hope was clearly, Putin's hope was that, that you know, he called on the Ukrainian military forces to lay down their arms. And he, uh, you know, expected basically to, to, to march into Kiev to, you know, get rid of Zelensky and impose a puppet government. None of this happened. And uh, in fact, what happened is, you know, this is a, you know, this is probably one of the most important uh, pictures in Ukrainian history. The day after the invasion, um, Zelensky, you know, could have left Ukraine because I think the expectation was that, um, you know, Russia would defeat Ukraine very quickly. But instead, he, he, this is in front of the presidential administration and he stood with a video camera, you know, and, he, and the, the phone and, you know, and his most powerful statement was President Tut, the president is here. And, you know, that is so important because, you know, if he had done something else, who knows? But I think you know, it was clear that he was not going to leave Kiev. Um, and that inspired many Ukrainians to, to, to battle against Russian aggression. Um, and in part because Russia did not come in with full force early on, uh, Russia, Ukraine was able to thwart um, the Russian invasion. And, you know, I guess the what's called sometimes the Battle of Kiev, uh, which was uh, won by Ukraine. In other words, they, they, they pushed back uh, the Russian invasion, um, you know, uh, to everyone's surprise. Um, next, you know, uh, Russia tried to take over Kharkiv, which is um, in, in eastern Ukraine, a traditionally considered a very pro-Russian city. Again, the Ukrainian military pushed back um, against um, uh, Russian, the invasion, um, and the Battle of Kharkiv was also won by Ukraine. Um, next, we can sort of, was I don't have here, but we have efforts uh, by Russia to control the Donbass, which is this area of Eastern Ukraine, uh, traditionally considered, again, Russophile or pro-Russian. Uh, Putin has had more success there and has, you know, taken over the entire province of Luhansk in, 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 in the far eastern Ukraine, um, but has still failed to take over the entire province of Donetsk. Um, I should have probably had a map here, but I don't. Um, and so it's been more of a stalemate in Donbass. Um, and what we're going through right now is at this point, the only major uh, provincial capital that Russian controls is the city of Kherson in southern Ukraine. Um, that's the only really major city that uh, that that Russia has taken over since um, February 2022. And right now, we're basically in the midst of a, a counteroffensive by the Ukrainians to retake Kherson. So we're all kind of you know, holding our breath collectively, you know, um, fingers crossed and really hoping that uh, the Ukrainians succeed um, in Kherson. Now, so why did, um, why nonetheless, um, we don't know what's going to happen in Kherson, but we do know it's pretty clear that um, Russia, you know, is, is, you know, did not take over U Ukrainian state. Um, it's kind of, I think, left that off as its ambition for now. And there's several reasons. One is that you know, Putin really thought of Ukraine as being completely artificial and not supported by the population and as being imposed by the United States and being neo-Nazi. So it really kind of believed that all you had to do was give it a little push and the Ukrainian state would collapse. But that is simply wrong. And you know um, he should have known that. Anybody who spent time in Ukraine knows that there is strong, even uh, what's interesting about Ukraine is that even among U Russian speakers, there's strong support for Ukrainian independence. So many, what's I think confusing to Russians is that many Ukrainians have strong attachment to Russian culture. They read Tolstoy, they read Dostoevsky, they like these old Soviet films in Russian, but 
you know, and so they, and so Putin sees that and he thinks, oh, they must be support, you know, union with Russia. But the truth is that you can like a culture or identify with a culture, but that, that doesn't mean you want to be part of that country. So, I mean, many of us, you know, many of you probably like American culture, right? Doesn't mean you want the United States, or you don't like it. Okay, never mind. Bad example. Okay, let's say you did. It does not mean that you want to become part of the United States, right? Those are two separate things. Um, the, second, the third thing I think is Zelensky's leadership. He was quite brave and unambiguous in his um, battle against uh, Russian aggression. You know, he's, you know, he's been, he's, what's interesting is that he was a TV star and he's very good at PR. So he has a good sort of instinct. Um, he's a very appealing guy. And so he, you know, he, early in the invasion when things were uncertain, he would have these dramatic videos of himself in the presidential uh, pal in, in, the, in the office, almost kind of kind of mocking Putin, daring him to bomb him. Um, and so I think you know that really kind of unified Ukrainians. He gives he still gives these regular nightly talks. Um, uh, you know I think that's been you know a key factor in Ukrainian success. You know there are some questions about how Zelensky dealt with the war that I can discuss in, in question and answer if you're interested. Um, the, the bottom line is I think he did kind of make key mistakes very early in the conflict, um, but we can talk about that separately. Um, now, I think the, the key, you know, the key sort of source of success has been Ukrainian, the troop morale, you know, the support, whereas for the Russians, um, the, you know, troop morale has been quite low, also, uh, the main problem for Russia has been the sort of lack of personnel um, to take over Ukraine. I mean, to really, for a country like Russia to really seize control of Ukraine, of a hostile country like Ukraine, it's estimated that it needs like, you know, hundreds of thousands of personnel in there to really secure control of the country. And which, you know, in principle, Russia has enough people in this country to do that. But Putin is sort of in a bind because he um, he wants to invade, but he doesn't want to you you know to basically undermine. Uh, he basically does not want to sort of do a mass mobilization for fear that that would increase opposition among Russians to his own power. So he's trying to sort of do this line to you know bring in enough Russian troops to to win the war, but at the same time not to do anything that would make him unpopular with the broader Russian population. This fact, the sort of lack of, of personnel has meant that his advances are very slow. At the same time, the real Russian advantage militarily is that it has a lot of military equipment and ammunition. I mean, this was a surprise to me. Over the course of the Soviet Union and these various conflicts in the 1990s with Chechnya, in the South, Russia just built an enormous stockpile of ammunition, you know, all of which goes together. Um, you know, it's all the, you know, the same system. So they, you know, they can just, you know, a lot of the equipment is, is much less sophisticated than the Western equipment that Ukraine has, but at a certain level, they can just throw dumb bombs you know, with enough, what they call dumb bombs, they can just throw them, they can, um, you know, prevent uh, Russia, Ukraine from retaking Russian controlled territory. So on the Ukrainian side, it's sort of the opposite. So Ukraine has much better morale. This is not, this is kind of not surprising. They're defending their own homeland. It's obvious why they're fighting this war. Um, however, they have much more limited access to equipment and ammunition. Um, you know, and you know, they've been getting enormous amounts of military, you know, billions of dollars of aid from the United States and Europe. But um, which has definitely been essential. I mean, without this aid, I think Ukraine, there's no doubt that Ukraine would be in a very different position militarily. But they have this kind of lost and found army um, in the sense where they're getting all this different equipment from all these different countries. And you can imagine, like, you have some you know, tanks from Germany, you know, ammunition from France. And so the stuff, you know, each has its own different instruction manual. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily go together. So, it's, you know, it's, it's 
I mean, they definitely are very happy to get this equipment, but you can imagine the sort of logistical difficulties of this sort of lost and found army. Um, there's one term I came up with, but you know, so I think that is, so that is the problem. So oftentimes, and oftentimes, Ukraine has been forced to fight with limited ammunition and, and limited military equipment. Um, so in a sense, um, I mean, overall, I think uh, in terms of military balance, Russia and Ukraine are relatively evenly matched. Um, so how does this end? Um, not soon, sadly. Um, you know, at one end we have the possibility of Russian, Ukraine, Russia takes control over Ukraine, creates a puppet government. I think this is the least likely scenario. I think, um, you know, as long as uh, the West continues to support Ukraine, you know, this is basically impossible. Um, you know, could you have a Ukrainian victory? I think this is slightly more likely. Um, you know, uh, by victory, I mean withdrawal to the February uh, 2022 borders. Uh, that's certainly possible, but it's going to be very hard um, for a, a number of reasons. First of all, Russia is a big country and, you know, it, it has a lot of military equipment. Um, and second of all, Putin power, I mean, the really only way to end this war ever would be for Putin, I mean, Putin could end this war literally right now. All he has to do is decide to end it. <laughs> but he shows no inclination to do that. And he's also insulated from uh, his population and others in the government. And so, in you know, I think unless Putin somehow you know, had, you know, changes his character or something or dies, then um, the, the Russia will stay in this war. So I think, you know, sadly, the most likely scenario is that this war will drag on for years, even if not decades. Um, and and yeah, I think the only thing we can hope is that is for mother nature to do its business on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's thanks. Right, thank you very much.